Last week on the program, we were talking with economist uh, and professor Richard Wolff uh, about a variety of issues. And as we uh, came to the conclusion of that conversation, we it took an extremely interesting turn, but we were out of time. So Professor Wolff has kindly agreed to come back and continue that conversation this week. Uh, just as a reminder, pro, uh, Richard Wolff is professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, visiting professor in the Graduate Program of International Affairs at the New School University in New York, and host of the program Economic Update on Free Speech TV Tuesday evenings at 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern. He also is the founder of Democracy at Work.info. And first of all, Richard Wolf, thanks for coming back. I'm glad to be here, RJ. It was a good conversation. Well, let's try to keep it going because what happened, and I, this is so important to me personally and I think to many people, what we started to talk about uh, was, um, you know, I, I said something, frankly, along the lines of, you know, maybe we need a new language to express uh, the, uh, the kinds of principles we've been talking about in terms of economic democracy and and and, and uh, the role of the public sector in a number of issues, and uh, then the clock ran out. So I guess I would say uh, maybe we can pick it up from there by saying I was almost saying if if I'm tough on myself, I I would say I was almost saying I'm like embarrassed to call myself a socialist, for example, or I think that if I do, it will hinder my political and communications effectiveness, um, and I, I run up against a torrent of people saying those are 19th century ideas, we face 21st century problems, you know the drill, you've heard it a million times, and uh, I think you had a, a different take on that, but I want to let you share it with us now. Okay, yes. Look, I understand these words come with a lot of baggage, whether it's capitalism or socialism or communism or liberalism or conservatism for that matter. Um, and there's a, a tendency, which I also understand, to want to kind of shed the baggage and start with a clean slate. Uh, the problem is when you start with a clean slate, it carries a certain risk, which is well, actually two risks. First, that you laboriously recreate uh, a, a knowledge, a set of ideas, an accumulation of debates that already exist if you're willing to live with the old language. In other words, there's a risk you reinvent the old wheels, and that's an enormous waste of time I don't think we have. And number two, an awful lot of smart people have debated the pros and cons of capitalism, the pros and cons of socialism. Much has been learned by the experiments in socialism, first in Russia in the 20th century, now in China in the 21st, and in other countries too. Uh, so we have an accumulated evidence about what socialisms have meant. We also know what the history of capitalism is. Those facts, those histories have informed the debate under the old terms. If I were convinced, and I am not, that people really mastered what there is to learn from the old literature, I'd be more comfortable about moving to a new one. But I know, as a professor all my life, dealing with students at all levels, that that old literature is not been digested, is not understood, for most Americans, for sure, but in other parts of the world, too, there is little or no familiarity. Therefore, I fear that a part of our history, a part of our legacy from struggles in the past that we need to use now is in that language, in the literature built on that language, and I would be very hesitant before um, supporting folks who just want to push all that aside. That's an old tendency, you know, you, you can't leap over history. Uh, if you don't learn its lessons, as somebody wise once said, you'll be condemned to repeat it, and that's not a fun process. So I, I would say, let's use the old language, let's make criticisms carefully and 
particularly where that language is insufficient, and then move on, but not a wholesale dismissal. That's a, a very bad way for us to move forward, in my judgment. As you were talking, Richard Wolf, one of the things that occurred to me was uh, that there are multiple fields of action here, right, that we're talking about. One is the field of thought, of ideas, of exchange, of um, the other is a field of activism, of political action. Another is the field of electoral politics, for lack of a better term. Another is the field of uh, communications, getting popular ideas into the culture and that kind of thing. And as you were talking, one of the things that occurred to me was that when it comes to the field, that we as a political culture in this country don't recognize those distinctions. So what we do, we, especially people who are mildly to the left and further to the left of the divide of the center, whatever that abstraction means, that what we tend to do is if somebody says, for example, to pick a Marxist idea, we ought to really think about the labor theory of value and whether there is a more just and reasonable way for working people to, uh, uh, to, to obtain the fruits of their labor. That is an idea, but far too often it seems to me in our internal discourse, uh, 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 you know, in the uh, uh, privileged world of the intellect, uh, far too often we don't even have that conversation because, of, well, that's kind of socialist and we don't do socialist, but maybe a, it needs to be an entirely different conversation. How would you present that idea? Uh, let's say, to the Fox News crowd, is something completely different from shouldn't we have a conversation? Do you get what I'm driving at? Yes, yes. Uh, I actually made exactly the effort you're describing. Uh, I've been on the Fox uh, television show a few times in the last several months, and I've tried to figure out how, to that particular audience, some of the arguments we have to make uh, can best be framed. And, and that's a reasonable exercise and I try to avoid jargon most of the time, uh, unless I think it's really helpful. But let me go back to the basic issue. Uh, I can't tell you, as I know you know, how many times I have been advised by people who think they're giving me good advice not to use words like socialism or Marxism or communism or anarchism uh, to describe those phenomena uh, because it turns people off. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, how do you square that with the following stark reality? From 1945 until 2016, that's roughly 75 years, it was an absolute taboo in the United States to use words like capitalism, uh, socialism, communism, and all of that. You, if you use them without a dismissive, angry hostility, you were considered disloyal or worse somehow. And so it became the, the, the understandable logic of people, stay away from those words, they get you into trouble, they're dangerous. And I can see in the inference, don't use them when you're trying to make a political point. Well, given all of that, look at the contrary evidence. For the first time in 75 years, a major politician, a senator, sitting senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders in 2016, runs for president in, you know, in the primary in the Democratic Party and does not renounce or deny or downplay that, yes, he is a socialist. And all of the pundits, virtually all of them, immediately said, understandably, that he had just committed political suicide, that he would get nowhere, that that word is such a turnoff that Americans would stop listening, and if he got more than one or two percent of the vote, it would be a miracle. Well, all those pundits were wrong, and the polls have been uninterrupted since 2016. Every poll taken indicates that the number of people who are comfortable or even favorable towards a socialism in America keeps rising. It's now clear majorities of people under 35 and there's no end of it in sight. It is a kind 
I'll use the word loosely, a kind of miracle. Somewhere, the socialism that was pejoratized, that was demonized, that was beaten out of American culture, where, it, by the way, it had been before 1945, never died. It just went into a hibernation, into an underground. And now that capitalism is proving itself to be the non-wonderful panacea that it tried to proclaim itself, now people are quickly rediscovering something. The, the fastest growing political movement in this country right now is the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. Who would have thought it? Who would have predicted it? I think this, however, for me, is a sign that what people are doing is they're turning to criticism of capitalism, then they're pursuing, uh, what do I read about that? Or what can I learn about that? Or who said something interesting about that? And boom, they pretty quickly find their way to the socialist literature, which is enormous, which is active in every country on this planet. There are socialists who are more powerful mostly than in the United States, so they have a lot to say. Uh, and I think that tradition is a gold mine, not just of things that socialists figured out that work, but things that socialists did that were mistakes, mm -hmm. that had bad results, where we want to learn precisely what not to do again, because socialists like us in the past tried that and it didn't go well. Look, that's the best way for us to proceed. So. Why don't we make a compromise? Let's hold on to the old language and literature, mine it for all that it can teach us, and then on that basis, if we want and need new terms, new words, new, new languages, fine. Make them serve the goal of making progressive change, and that goal is served not by a lopsided rejection of the past and a new rush into the future, but a much more basically balanced utilization of both the past thinking, the past activity, and what it has to teach us. We're talking with Professor Richard Wolf, and uh, as an economist, uh, if we leave aside so much of the ideology that seems to burden the field of economics nowadays, which I know you do, but uh, you know, economics strikes me as the study in part of uh, of change, of uh, rather than the modern ethos of most econo uh, economists, which seems to be the study of uh, a mythical uh, uh, free market pr machine in permanent stasis, it seems to me if you look back over the economic history, you have these periods of transformation for good, you know, both ways, right? I mean, you have all of a sudden everybody wants to buy Dutch tulips or whatever. You have you have a tulip branch, all of a sudden everybody wants to buy land in Florida, you have the land. Okay, but you know, they're not always good. But the fact is, if you go over the sweep of history, there have been points of radical transformation. Russian history, both before and after the Russian Revolution, for example, enormous changes taking place. So, I guess the broadest question I would give you, but it, 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 it's in this context, is let's say a growing movement, as you point out, a majority of young people uh, support the idea of socialism. Capitalism is widely discredited, especially the younger you are, and why wouldn't it be given student debt and all the other things that, uh, that plague young people nowadays. Um, with all that in play, does your sense of the sweep of economic history give you any feeling that socialists might win, I don't know, the Iowa governorship or uh, Wyoming or something at some point in the foreseeable future? Well, I think you put your finger on a very important matter. I, I've been a professor of economics all my adult life, uh, and I've had to study that literature. And luckily, uh, I had some good teachers who made sure that I studied the old economists and not just the ones working now. So let me underscore and slightly expand your point. If you go back to the, um, if you go back to the uh, origins of our modern discipline of economics, and you go back to the key writers that almost everyone agrees are the, if you like, the founders or fathers of the discipline, folks like Adam Smith or David Ricardo, 
uh, or Marx or John Stuart Mill, the other great uh, founders of this, you'll, you'll note that for them, economic change was probably one of the most important questions. And they wanted to teach us in their writings that the old system, the feudalism that Europeans had inherited for the thousand years of 500 AD, roughly to 1500 AD, that that feudalism was something that it was good to see go. That the new system, mm -hmm. which they celebrate, capitalism, was in their view more productive, more geared to raising the standards of people's lives. It was a positive transformation and they were interested in showing how that was the case why that was the case. And they developed a new science, partly to analyze, but partly to celebrate what they were analyzing. Mm -hmm. 150 years later, you get what's called the marginalist or the neoclassical revolution, because Smith and Ricardo were called classical economists. So 150 years later, capitalism is now established all over Europe and is spreading all over the world, and it's got some new critics that didn't exist in the time of Adam Smith, a working class that is beginning to look towards socialism, and you have a big switch in economics from an analysis and a celebration of change, to use your words, and they're good words, to an analysis and celebration of a seemingly timeless machine, one that is perfect, they use words like that, perfect competition, optimality, the very words of this kind of economics. It's now called neoclassical economics. It's all about capitalism as if it were kind of always there, as if it will always be there. Look, this is a very bad conscience that's speaking in this kind of economics. Those people don't know that this system will last forever. I'm in much better shape by arguing that capitalism will more likely represent every other system that has been born, evolved over time, and died. We don't have feudalism anymore. We don't have slavery anymore. We don't have clan economies, village economies of the sort we once had. All of those systems came and went. Why in the world should we believe that capitalism only came, only evolved, and is now in some perfect stasis where we don't have to answer those kinds of questions about change. And I'm very confident that as the problems of capitalism deepen, not only will you see the polls showing interest in, in socialism as a different, a better system than capitalism, you're going to see even in the slow moving, typically ideologically befuddled economics profession, the new and younger voices are going in that direction. They are going to develop the analytical tools to talk about how we can do better than capitalism. What kind of a system could we develop that doesn't have the problems that capitalism presents? And particularly the three or four major ones. And let me mention them so it's clear what I'm saying. Number one, the instability, the every four to seven year crash sometimes terrible, like 2008 or the 1930s, sometimes short and shallow, but always there disrupting homes, lives, educations, you name it. Can we get a system that does not do that to us? Number two, can we get a system that doesn't tend to these monumental inequalities so that today less than 100 people, the 100 richest, have more wealth together than the bottom half of the planet, which is three and a half billion people? That's an indictment of a system that produces such results. Number three, the fundamental undemocratic system. The workplace in capitalism has a few people at the top, the owner, the major shareholders, the board of directors, whatever you name them, they make all the decisions. They decide what we produce and how we produce and where we produce and what to do with the profits we all help to produce. They're not accountable to us. We don't elect them. We have no power over them. Democracy in the workplace never existed in capitalism. It was at best put into the neighborhood where we live as if we weren't spending most of our adult life in the workplace where we do our labor. So it's an undemocratic system. We can do better than that. And finally, the one that people are aware of, that it's an unsustainable system. 
Capitalism has largely destroyed the natu natural environment in a way earlier systems couldn't and didn't do. We need to come up with a modern society that is not unsustainable in terms of the environment. Those are the things people are going to know they have to do. The so, climate is teaching us that. Everything is teaching us that. But conventional economics stuck in this fantasy ideology that capitalism is forever is increasingly useless and irrelevant to what has to be done. A couple thoughts before we go, Richard Wolf, and then I'll let you conclude. One, when we were talking about that the machine that they mythologize, I don't know if you remember the old science fiction movie M from 1932 by Fritz Lang with Peter Lorre, yes. or no, Peter, not Peter Lorre, but uh, I'm thinking Metropolis, actually, the movie where they're feeding the giant furnace endlessly, and that's the mythology that we must all feed this giant furnace, this economic furnace to which we are all slaves and servants, which gets me to uh, each of the systems you described that fell, I would venture to say its participants didn't realize it was going to fall until very near the end. And number three, uh, if we, you know, I know we agree that the Soviet Union was was a totalitarian and uh, and incorporated some socialist and communist elements, but had totalitarian factors. But one of the architects soon expelled was Leon Trotsky, who wrote. Uh, this is the tie-in with Metropolis. Leon Trotsky wrote an essay called uh, Vodka, the Church, and the Cinema, if I recall correctly. And uh, uh, while it may have been used to justify repressive m measures, I think he was onto something in the sense that channels of communication, maybe this will be for our next conversation, channels of communication and thought and culture, which in his day the cinema was the new innovation, uh, could drive change. And I would argue we have new channels now with the internet and so on. But um, I guess I would say in the way of wrapping up, there are a lot of fertile ideas out there to be explored and expanded upon. Um, any thoughts on what the next phase of this conversation ought to look like? Yeah, I think the, the social media, the internet and all of that are a wonderful new opportunity for conversations uh, to get out. I certainly believe, and I'm now speaking personally about my own history, I have done more communicating about a critical stance towards capitalism as an economic system. I've done more communication publicly in the last five years than I did in the pre previous 50, and it's not even close. Something is going on in the United States, because that's the main area in which I communicate, that has exploded the means for me to communicate and the appetite among the American people to hear these kinds of communications. I have no illusion, they don't all agree with me, the folks I interact with, but they are looking for answers and they are willing to consider criticism of capitalism, advocacy for the notion that we can do better than capitalism. They're willing to entertain proposals, ideas, trains of thought, and I think part of the credit for that goes to the internet and to the social media that have made these kinds of conversations much easier to have, much less costly to undertake. Uh, and so my hat is off to them, uh, even if that was not the intent. Look, I, I say with, with, with a joke, but it's not, it's not untrue, that probably the best organizer of my audience is Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. The more he says and the more he does, the more people find their way uh, to have a conversation with me. So I owe him something as well. Well, I, that seems like as good a place as any to conclude. And when, when, I, when I get my way and the internet is nationalized, that conversation will be spurred even further. But unfortunately, I know we have to leave it there. So Professor Wolf, Richard Wolf, uh, the program is Economic Update on Free Speech TV, democracyatwork.info. As always, a great pleasure talking to you. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure as well, RJ. And I look forward to our next opportunity.